I want to tell you a story um, because I'm a heart surgeon. I only know things between here and here. Um, but the story I want to tell you is about dealing with the impossible. It's about never giving up until the moment that you think you should and it should be right. The story is about one boy, one unbelievably simple problem, and an amazing mother. It's the one about courage, innovation, and teamwork. And we've heard all of those words except teamwork so far. His name is Kieran. He's about the same age as you now. And that's his mother, Colleen, who's astonishing. Everything that we have done for Kieran was in the one in 10 in the world. He had a problem with his trachea between the voice box and the lungs where the air is delivered. And the problem he had was that instead of being a normal width, it was narrow, extremely narrow. And it's a condition called long segment tracheal stenosis. You don't really need to remember that, it's just narrow. And if you took a cross section in the middle of his airway, it was one millimeter across, one millimeter. I only see well, around 10 of these patients from all over the country in a whole year. It's hard to know what a millimeter looks like, but it's the tip of a pencil. And there next to it is Kieran's airway when we looked down just after he was born, one millimeter. And unsurprisingly, he found it difficult to breathe. But he had to feed, breastfeeding is really hard work for a baby. And they get very breathless while they're doing it because they're sucking and breathing and trying to do it. And if for you or I, it's a bit like running 100 meters, as hard as you possibly can. And if you have an airway like he had, it's like being handed a straw to breathe through at the end. Just imagine how you would feel. And when Kieran was born, it was even worse than that because he actually couldn't breathe. And we had to find a way to get him through that early phase of his life. And we used a thing called ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's like a heart-lung machine by the bedside. If we zoom in, you can see here a blue, a blue tube with blue blood coming out of a neck vein and a red blood coming back after we've oxygenated and pumped it back so we can keep him alive and he doesn't have to breathe. And he had um, an x-ray at that time where you can see his lungs are all whited out. They're not working in those two pipes keeping him alive. So now what do we do? Here he is with a narrow airway stuck on a machine at the age of a day. Well, in those days, um, we used to fix it by putting a patch on it, making a little cut down the front of the trachea, putting a patch on it, a bit like widening your trousers. But what we use, because it's there, is the membrane that covers the heart. The heart sits in a bag so it can move around, and the bag you don't need very much, so you can take pieces of it, and that's called pericardium, and you can make a little patch. Because what you see is that that pericardium is really thin, really flexible, and very easy to use. And this is a little piece of film from when we did that operation. It's nearby and it's easy. The problem is, whenever you have a scar or something thin, it shrinks and it scars and eventually it blocks the airway up. And that happened to Kieran. Three months, his airway got narrow again and we had to do something else to keep his airway open. And so we used a stent. Here's a stent. And you can see, looking at it, it's a little piece of wire netting crimped onto a balloon that you can blow up. And when you've blown it up in the airway, it leaves behind the wire netting and holds the tube open. You can breathe again. He was one of the first 10 in the world, ever to, children, ever to have a metal stent in the airway. I had no idea what the long-term consequences were going to be. Now, at three years, something else happened to him. Now, here's his stent again. I can show you here, in his airway. And the, remember, the pericardium is really thin. And behind it is this stent. And overlying it is a big blood vessel, the aorta and thing called the innominate artery to the right arm. So here's this stent trying to push the trachea open, and it gradually squeezes its way through the pericardium and eats its way into the aorta. And he bleeds big time. And astonishingly, his mother, his amazing mother, Colleen, managed to resuscitate him. To this day, I don't know how. And she brought him to the hospital, and on a Friday night, and it's always a Friday night in my experience, I tried something else new. And this is a pickle trachea, a human trachea from a donor that we had stored in, in formaldehyde and acetone and a few other things. 
And it's a bit like leather, but it's the right shape. And we used it to stitch onto his aorta and to repair it, into, onto his trachea and, we, and to repair it. It was one of the first two that we'd ever done in the world, and I'd done the other one. I had no idea what the long-term consequences would be. He did really well for 12 years until 2009 when this happened. This is the stent that was put in after that operation, and that's his aorta. And that white stuff on the inside of the stent is a blood clot again. He bled again, this time in Ireland where he lived. And his mother, amazing mother Colleen, resuscitated him. We sedated him, put him in hospital in Ireland, and then we had to do the next thing. We wanted to put in another homograph, but by then there'd been the BSE crisis, mad cow disease, and things called prions, and the regulations changed, and we weren't allowed to use this tissue that we'd used last time. So now what do we do? He's going to die if we don't do anything. Now, we've been working with Barcelona, with Bristol, with Florence, and with Cambridge, and several hospitals in London, to try and grow tracheas, because we thought we might need one one day, and grow them from stem cells, as you probably know, you can get from bone marrow or from embryos or from amni amniotic fluid. And these are cells that can become any other cells. They're pluripotent. If you train them properly, they can end up being whatever you want them to be. And this is an animation I've got from uh, Paolo Macchiarini, who helped us do the surgery, who is a surgeon then in Florence, but who's moved around the world and now is based in Sweden. And what we did was to take a trachea from a donor in Italy. And then once we'd taken that, this is like a transplant donor, someone who died, and then wash out all the donor cells, everything that identifies that trachea as coming from that person, wash them out with detergents and enzymes until it's just a skeleton of collagen, the basic protein. Shove it in a fridge at four degrees, and then when Kieran came to the hospital to have his operation, we took stem cells from his bone marrow, separated out the stem cells, a bit of respiratory cell lining, and then um, we put those into a motorbike with the graft and took it up to uh, the hospital at Royal Free while I took out his trachea. And at the Royal Free, where we have a manufacturing facility, we marinated that um, graft after injecting it with some chemicals. We marinated it with the stem cells for two hours. We got 37 million stem cells just from that uh, um, uh, sample from the bone marrow. There it is being marinated. And then we injected it with some other stuff so that when it got put in, we would encourage the growth of blood vessels, what was called EPO. We put the lining of the epithelium from the respiratory system and the inside and brought it back in a motorbike to Great Ormond Street ready for implantation. And now, it had taken me nearly three hours to get his old trachea out and rebuild his aorta. And all of this was going on in that time. And um, this came back down, and then I was able to stitch this tube into, into Kieran. This was the longest piece of trachea that had ever been moved around in a human of any age, and the first time anything like this had been tried in a child. And here is that graph. This is the Armani graph from Italy, beautiful, elegant, extremely pretty. And in the middle of it is a little blue stent that you can see. It's not like those metal stents because we knew that they eroded through. So we'd been working with a company in Prague to make a stent that would absorb and go away. And this is made of uh, long polymers of glucose and would gradually hydrolyze, hydrolyze and disappear. So that was there holding that in the right shape. And we were able to put in seven centimeters of airway to keep him alive. The first stem cell transplant in a child in the world, and the first of 10 absorbable stents. We had no idea what the consequences would be. We looked down every day, there's his stent. He had a bit of problem at the beginning, and we put in some temporary stents. This is what it looks like when you look down inside the airway. And we were able to take the temporary stents out after a few days, and then it looked healing, quite good, and you can see the stent starting to absorb on the outside. After Six months, this is the only science in the whole talk, he had little cells on his biopsy, which are the cilial cells that you will know about in the trachea, which pump mucus up from the bottom of the trachea. So he'd had beforehand this tube with no blood, no special cells, 
no blood supply, and within six months he had a blood supply, and it had all organized itself into looking roughly like a trachea, trachea with no drugs and no anti-rejection therapy. Now, he did really well, and I'm delighted to say that in 2012, he was made the Irish child of courage and got dressed up, and we had a great party in Ireland, and he was able to... <laughs> He plays drums a lot, and this is in a, a famous Irish show band. He does plays the drums every week somewhere. He now still does that. He's now grown up from that time. It's 2015, and he's put on 20 kilos. But I was really pleased talking about when things really move you. I bumped into this book because somebody else was doing their GCSEs at the time, and in the middle of this, not only was the first black president of the United States in there, but just below him was Kieran, the first stem cell transplant, and both of us were pretty proud, I have to say. Now, he's kicked off a lot of other firsts. We do, for other reasons that I haven't got time to talk about, we work a lot with Formula One, and we've been interested in how they measure the aerodynamics of cars, uh, and we, with Kieran, have been trying to work a non-invasive way of following up so I don't have to stick tubes down anymore, giving an anesthetic. So just using a CT, We've taken the CT data, put the CT data in the same model that we would use for um, a Formula One car, and you can see that we've got flow, airflow information, which have said he's grown during those four years, but his trachea hasn't. So we've given him a new tube, but it's not growing at the same rate he is, and he has got some problems down here. He's helped us trigger off other ways of growing trachea, and we're making new materials made of nanotechnology that we can print that human cells will grow into. And here's a 3D printed trachea on the left, and on the right, sitting in a bioreactor so that human cells might grow into it. That's all research going on now because of Kieran. But the thing is, and what I want you to think about as we close, is we could do, we could do all this stuff, and we did it. But should we have done it? Should we have done it? You just heard a really inspiring talk about disability, but I had no idea on day one of Kieran's life how much disability I might cause him. His parents had hope about a good future for him. He could have died if I'd left him alone, and they could have had another baby quite quickly and grieved and remembered but we decided to go ahead and do something. At three months, he had something else new. At three years, he had something else new. At 10 years, he had something else new. 12 years, he's had something else new. And no time during that stage had we any idea what the outcome was going to be. Was it ethical? Well, I think we had the expertise and the technical know-how, but we didn't know the hazards I'm pretty sure we got informed consent. It took three months to get consent for the last procedure. I've got a big conflict of interest, though, because I'm standing up here talking about it. It's been good for my career and for all of the team that I work with. So are we doing it for me? Or was I doing it for him? And was I thinking about his parents and his siblings? We've got big grants. We've got a huge team. We're doing good stuff. But they had the courage and we shared with them our knowledge. And without that, without that effort that they put in, we wouldn't be anywhere. But I still don't know whether it was right, because it might all have turned out very badly. And what do I do tomorrow for a newborn baby when I've got a new thing in my briefcase to try? Should I offer it? Is hope better than action? Is it better sometimes to let a baby die so that the family can have another one? I don't know the answer to those questions. But without Kieran and his mother taking part in an experiment with, as voluntarily throughout their lives, we'll never be able to make progress. We live on the shoulders of the patients and not only on the shoulders of the scientists who did stuff in each generation. Thank you very much. Thank you.